What's up guys, it's Brandon Flash. Today we're here with my 2022 Polestar 2 and we're gonna be doing a bit of a review and we're gonna be doing it in a top 10 likes and dislikes format. As I mentioned, this is my 2022 Polestar 2. This vehicle has the pilot package but does not have the plus or the performance package. So we have the base 19 inch wheels, we have the void as the exterior color, and we have zinc cloth as the interior. I don't know if they technically call it cloth, but it's basically cloth, it's not leather. So let me do a walk around here, show you the car, and then we'll hop inside, we'll talk about my top 10 likes and dislikes, and we might even have a bonus like or dislike. Stay tuned. So here is the car, my great looking Void Polestar 2. We have the 19 inch base wheels. Got the sticker here, I haven't taken it off. Uh, 78 kilowatt hour, 300 kilowatts. So you have a 150 kilowatt motor in the front and 150 kilowatt motor in the rear because this is the dual motor model. Coming around, you've got the awesome mirrors that are actually kind of frameless, I guess you would describe them as. The whole thing moves when you adjust the mirror, which I think is super cool. Uh, no other mirror really comes close as far as how cool these look while you're driving. It's the little thing sometimes. You've got keyless entry uh, touch buttons on all four doors, which is really cool. Not too many cars you see that on. Here we have the charge port, CCS of course, you've got your J1772 up top and then CCS is the entire port here. I did remove the little uh, cover there for the DC pins because I DC fast charge fairly frequently and I remove those on pretty much any car that has a plug versus just like a flap, like a Rivian or an e-tron or something like that. Nothing special there. This car will AC charge at 11 kilowatts or 48 amps, and it will DC fast charge up to 150 kilowatts. Here we come around the back. It looks like a sedan, but it's actually a hatchback. We'll go inside in just a moment. Uh, I love the taillights, and when you lock or unlock, they actually do a sequence that kind of comes in and out. Don't think I'll be able to capture that on camera, unfortunately. Other side looks pretty much the same as well. So let's open up some of the doors and things and I'll show you inside. As I mentioned, this has the pilot package. So we have a camera up front. Really love the color matched emblem. So that's on, I believe all of them that they have color matched emblems. And being a 2022 with the void, it doesn't have the silver or chrome around the grill. It actually has color matched. So it's kind of a chrome delete from the factory and I think it looks stunning. This is a stellar looking car. But as I mentioned, let's look inside. So we'll start with the front trunk. You pop it just like a normal hood, which is a little weird. There's no electronic release and you actually do have to release a secondary release over here. A little tip on any Volvo, uh, they normally have the little line across the grill and that will point you to where the release is. But being a Polestar, that still applies. And this is kind of jamming actually, so. Not sure why that was giving me so much trouble, but kind of as I was mentioning, uh, on a Volvo, you would normally have the bar coming across the grill, and that typically points you roughly to where the release is, and being kind of a Volvo-ish car, it has the same thing, but without the line. So here we have the included EVSE, which will do, uh, out, maximum output is 9.6 kilowatts, so this is 40 amps. I haven't actually used it yet, because I have charging at home and at work that doesn't require that. We've got your little uh, repair kit for the tires. You actually have a jack, which is really interesting for a car that doesn't have a spare tire. I don't personally see a benefit of having a jack with that, but I guess you could take it off and bring it with you. Doesn't hurt to have it, but does take up space. And being in North America, we have this little divider here because there's no emergency release. So you can't have it be small enough that a child could get trapped in there. Washer fluid over here, nothing special. I haven't actually touched that since I got the car. I'll shut this. Has latches on both sides, so you normally want to use two hands, but doing it like that works too. Let's go around to the trunk before we really head inside. As I mentioned, it is a uh, power lift gate and hatchback versus normal trunk. Got my bin of junk back here, but quite a bit of space and we've got a 12 volt power and we've got a little basket over here with you can put stuff. And there's actually a fair amount of space underneath. Then I've got some stuff in. Uh, it's certainly not a Tesla Model Y with tons and tons of space, but it's not bad. This is 
fairly deep. Let's hop inside. And coming around, let's go inside, start with the back seat here. So pretty decent space. This is what the seat set for me. I'm six foot three, so I would say usable leg room back here, but not great. You could sit back here if you needed to, if you're not huge. Here we've got the little fold down cup holder. Materials are nice. I think they'll hold up really well. We actually do have a ski pass through here. I don't fully know how this works. Let me figure this out here. So I figured out the ski pass through. So it turns out you have to open it from the rear here and then you can pass through, which is kind of cool. Nice if you're hauling anything long. And it has this nice little cover here. So you don't have to look at that if you're not actually using it. It's the small things. These cup holders are utterly useless. Uh, these little flaps are way too flimsy. They don't hold anything in. And if you have something here, also because it's not too deep enough, and you take a corner, it will just fall out and end up on the seat. So lesson learned there. We do have rear vents, which is nice. Not super common on not SUVs. And back here, this looks like it would be a 12 volt outlet, but it's not. You actually have two uh, USB-C back here, and I believe these are only 15 watt, roughly. Don't quote me on that, but I believe that is correct. And on the XC40, this is actually a 12 volt, so. I would have preferred 12 volt. We'll get into that in just a moment. Door cards, I think they look pretty nice. And now up to the front seat. So you've got some storage up here, nice door cards as well. You have four window buttons. And if you're wondering why I'm pointing that out, watch my ID4 review. Uh, these floor mats are pretty annoying. These are the factory mats and I often will catch it on my way out and it kind of folds up. Not ideal. Uh, here we have the seats, pretty similar to the rear. You've got kind of this three-tone going on. This is kind of an Alcantara-ish. You've got this lighter gray and then the darker gray. I think it's, it looks nice. Probably not something I would specifically choose, but it works. And you have a partial power seat. So you have power lumbar and power forward, back, up, down. But you actually have manual tilt. So this is how you tilt the seat right there. It's pretty annoying, so hopefully you don't need to adjust it very often. Got the steering wheel. This has uh, piano black buttons, but they are actual buttons. They're not capacitive. Got your wipers, or sorry, your um, light controls over here and your wiper controls over here and your instrument cluster. I'm a huge fan of the trim that they use on the base model instead of the wood like they do on the higher end models. Down here, you've got a little bit of a storage compartment. On the plus trim, you get a uh, wireless charging pad there, but I don't like wireless charging pads, so I'm fine with that not being there. And if you watched my previous video, Fingerprints Be Damned, this is wrapped with 3M vinyl, and this is a screen protector, so that's not factory. Here you've got your little uh, purse hook of sorts, so that flips over as needed. Just like that, so I'll leave that out. And let's take a look at the window sticker. So here we have dual motor, pilot is the only package, destination charge, and 54.4 is the total price there. You can kind of see some of the features there, pause if needed. Over here we can see the rated range, 249 miles, and it's rated for uh, 380 watt hour per mile or 38 kilowatt hour per 100 miles. Doesn't have crash rating. And the passenger seat is the exact same as the driver's seat, partial power. Um, and like I said, this is the base model, so it doesn't have, I believe, Bowers and Wilkins? Maybe Harman Kardon sound system. I don't recall what the upgraded sound system is. And now that we're inside the car, let's dive into the top 10 likes and dislikes. We're going to start from the bottom with dislikes, starting with number 10. Though these really aren't in any order. Some might bother more other people more than others, and I just kind of wrote these as I thought of them. The sound system is good, but it's not great. Uh, that is speaking specifically to the bass audio system. So take that with a grain of salt. If you really care about audio systems, get the plus package. You also get a bunch of other stuff with that package, but specifically the sound system is upgraded and hopefully quite a bit better. This is not bad, don't get me wrong. It's certainly a lot better than the Volkswagen ID4 I had before, 
but it's not great. It's missing a little bit on the sub 120 hertz range, I would say, kind of on that low bass, and it's also missing a little bit in the mid range. So not terrible. Most people probably won't care, but it's not stellar. Uh, with the app, you can actually only set the climate control to run for 30 minutes, but it actually does tell you a countdown on the app, so you can kind of know how long it's been and whether you need to turn it back on. And whenever you're running the parking climate, as they call it, it will only run at 22 Celsius, which I believe is roughly 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And the weird part is, on the touchscreen, if you get in the car while that's running, it will actually show 22 Celsius, even if you have the car in Fahrenheit, which I think is kind of a weird little bug. Not the end of the world, and 72 is a pretty reasonable temperature year-round, but I do wish I could set it to run at, say, max AC, uh, for example, if it's really hot out, or max heat if it's really cold out and I'm trying to, like, melt some ice off the windows. I just wish you could customize that. I think that's a pretty reasonable ask. But it is a lot more effective than, say, the Volkswagen ID4 that only runs at partial power, so overall decently happy with it but it could be improved with a little bit more options for customization uh apps like a better route planner actually can't run in the background so that's number nine here so if you're running on if you have a better route planner running on the android automotive system and you close out of it to go say to spotify or to adjust your climate it actually kills the app and it doesn't run in the background so unfortunately it won't let a better route planner log say your trips or your charging or anything while it's in the background. So it kind of isn't that useful to have a better route planner in the car. You're better off using the Google Maps. And the Google Maps actually does include uh, charging stops and route planning and all that. So it works pretty well. I think the steering wheel could come out farther. So I'm a bit tall, so I have to have the seat pretty much all the way back. I think it is all, yep, all the way back. Uh, so the steering wheel, <laughs> It's just a little too far forward. I wish it could just telescope a little bit closer to me. Again, not the end of the world and it's fine, but if I was naming things that could be improved, that would be on there. Getting back to the route planner that I just talked about with the better route planner, the Google route planner is actually super pessimistic. So if you've watched my road trips and I highly recommend you do, you've seen that if I leave home and I set my destination to a charger that's say 200 miles away that I know I can make it to, because the car does have a rated range of 250 miles, it will say that I'll get there with say negative 2%. But then by the time I actually get there, I'll arrive with 10, 15, 20%. Uh, so it's very pessimistic, which is, I would say better for most people, but probably not to that extent. It should be more realistic, I would say. At least it's better than how Tesla used to be where it was pretty optimistic and then you would have to slow down. But at least for me, if I'm driving how I normally drive, which is fairly quick, I can still arrive with significantly more than the uh, range planner will guess I will get there with. Getting back to the 12 volt outlet and the USB-C in the back seat, one of my items on here, number five, is that there's no 12 volt outlet in the cabin. So there's no 12 volt outlet anywhere in this car aside from the one I showed you in the trunk during the walk around. It's just a little strange. Uh, I realize most things do use USB-C these days, but it also, it's still a car. I think 12 volt is a very useful thing. I'm not sure why like Volkswagen and Polestar decided that EV drivers don't need 12 volt outlets because we do. So stop it automakers. Give us our 12 volt outlets, please. And actually getting to one of my biggest issues that I've had with this car, there is the module called the TCAM, which I believe is telecommunications, yeah, telecommunication access module, I believe is what it stands for. Basically, it's all your connectivity, your GPS and your keys. And mine actually, I wouldn't say it failed, but it faulted out, I would best describe it as. And this is a fairly well-known issue in the Polestar 2 and all of these uh, CMA, I believe, is the architecture of this car, cars, so like the XC40 as well. And essentially to reset it, you have to disconnect the 12-volt battery under the uh, hood, and then there's a small lithium-ion battery, like a little, uh, say, 5,000 milliamp hour backup battery you'd use for your phone, 
hidden in the trunk behind the trim. So it's really annoying to get to. And when that fails, or when it faults, I should say, your navigation no longer works because it no longer has GPS. Uh, in some cases, it can completely kill your connectivity for everything. Mine still worked, it would still run Spotify and things. Uh, your app stops working and your physical keys stop working. So luckily I set up phone key, which actually works pretty well. Uh, and that would let me in because that uses Bluetooth rather than the typical RF, I believe it is, um, key connectivity that you would use to get into the car and lock, unlock it. So that's uh, not the best issue to have. And especially as frequently as it seems to be happening for people. Um, worth mentioning, this is a 2022 and it has the 2.2 software, so it's possible they could resolve this in the future with software updates, but it seems to be more of a hardware issue from what I've read, but I'm not an expert on this particular matter. Uh, and there's no easy way to switch between apps on the touchscreen. So you have to actually go to the home screen and then you can go into the next app. I'll show you that as well. So I wish there was like a swipe or a double tap or something. and if I'm missing something, please call me out down below, but I don't think I'm missing anything. I think I've tried everything, but it's pretty annoying to have to go to the home screen to just go between say maps and Spotify. If you want to change a playlist or whatever, I think it's pretty common. You'd want to go between those and you can't even have like an overlay of the song you're playing on the map, like you could on some other cars. So room for improvement there. And another one of my annoyances with this car uh, in my dislikes, and this is number 11 if you're paying close attention, this is the bonus dislike, the cup holders. They're just dumb. There's one cup holder in the console, I'll show you closer here, and then there's another one literally in the center console. So you have to have the center car or the armrest open in order to use the second cup holder and not have an armrest. And I this would be acceptable, I would say, on a sports car that you're only probably driving on the weekends for most people. But this is a daily driver electric car. I don't think it's unreasonable to expect two usable cup holders in a four-door passenger vehicle. And editor Brandon here. I somehow managed to forget two of the things even though I was following a list. Uh, one of them is the piano black around the trim of the shifter or yeah, electronic gear selector, I suppose, um, as well as the piano black on the steering wheel. It's not terrible, and if you watch my Fingerprints Be Damn video, you saw that I eliminated the uh, piano black there with some 3M wrap, so that turned out well and it looks fine, um, but you shouldn't have to do that. I wish they would just stop using piano black. It shows fingerprints and shininess, and it's just not a good finish to use in any car, so I don't know why every automaker seems to want to use piano black. And the other, thing I forgot is the range and charging. So the Polestar 2 is rated for 250 miles on the dual motor variant. I believe the single motor variant is 270, but you lose a ton of power. So really that's not that big of an improvement considering that. Um, I think the range is mostly adequate, but it's certainly not class leading by any means. Uh, with the 250 mile rated range, realistically, you'll probably get around 200 at interstate speeds. Maybe a little low, or maybe a little higher if you drive nicely or a little slower, but if you're driving like people do in the Southeast at 75, 85, somewhere in there, I'd plan on high 100s, like 180, 190, or low 200s, depending on weather and temperature and all that fun stuff. And the charging, while it does peak at 150 kilowatts, uh, the charge curve is not great, and I would basically not plan on ever going above 90% because it drops down to as low as about three kilowatts as it gets towards the top of the pack. Really bad. Uh, and when you get below 7%, it actually goes into turtle mode. So you lose a ton of power and below, I'd say about roughly 4%, it becomes pretty much dangerously slow. Like I could probably race the Polestar 2 at 4% with an e-bike and the e-bike would probably win. So realistically, you can only use the pack from 7% to roughly 90%. Uh, on road trips. Of course, you can start at 100% from home, but on the road, I would never plan on going above 90% just given how poorly it charges at higher state of charge, which is a bit of a contrast to cars like the Ionic 5, EV6, uh, even the ID4. It's not terrible to go pretty high state of charge if you need the range, 
Uh, I mean, obviously it does slow, but it's not like this car where it, I think it took over an hour to go from 80 to 100%. I think it was like 90 minutes, some crazy amount of time to go from 80 to 90% or from 80 to 100%. Whereas the five-ish to 90% is not class leading, but not terrible. It's roughly 37 minutes. So uh, if you're road tripping a lot, the Polestar 2 might not be the best choice in that regard, which is kind of a shame because the route planning is really good. If only you could combine the route planning and software from the Polestar 2 into an Ionic 5 or EV6 or something. And just like that, we're on to the things that I do like. And while I can get a little passionate about the things that bother me in cars, overall, I would say all the things on my dislike list are fairly minor with the exception of probably the TCAM issues uh, and maybe the cup holders. I'd say that's pretty darn annoying for your everyday use. But the rest of them are pretty minor issues that don't really impact your day-to-day -day use a ton. I'm just a pretty heavy user of vehicles. This has 3,800 miles in about a month and a half. And when you spend a lot of time in a car, the little things can start to annoy you a little bit. So like I said, on to the likes. Again, these are in no order, just kind of things that I thought of and I did number them, but they're not in order. The pedal calibration in this car is fantastic it has one pedal driving it's super smooth the transition between acceleration and deceleration is really i would say predictable is the best way to describe it it doesn't have a dead spot it doesn't lurch uh it's basically the exact opposite of a maki -E as far as pedal calibration it's really really good or is the maki -E and i would assume the f-150 lightning i haven't driven one yet the pedal calibration is really bad and actually has kind of a dead spot and is actually difficult to drive at low speeds smoothly. So really well done to the pedal calibration engineers at Polestar Volvo. Uh, it, it just works and there's no modes or anything. It just, it just works every time. It's great. Uh, I barely use the brake pedal um, and you can drive this car slowly. You can drive this car quickly and it just reacts how you would expect it to. Pilot Assist, which is what Volvo Polestar call their autopilot-ish system. Uh, it's basically their uh, adaptive cruise control and lane keeping system. It works really well, actually. The Similar to the pedal calibration, it's actually really smooth as far as how it adjusts speed. Uh, the lane keeping is not fantastic, but it's pretty good. And especially on straighter roads, it does kind of fall apart if the lane markings are faded or not really present or if it's really curvy. So use caution when you're using it, but it does make your driving a lot less stressful. I do wish it had a capacitive steering wheel like I had on the Volkswagen ID4 rather than torque sensor, but still works really well. And I'd say it's definitely worth getting the pilot package for pilot assist as, as well as all the other things you get with the pilot package. Uh, you get better lights, you get the 360 cam and cameras on all four sides that you can pull up individually. Uh, you also get um, forward collision warning. That might be standard, actually. You get rear cross traffic alert and then a couple other things. I'd say it's worth it for the safety features alone. And the build quality on this car, number eight here, it's awesome. Uh, the car just feels really solid. Uh, there's no creaks, rattles, things like that. It just, it's well put together. This car is actually made in China. So pretty impressed with the overall build quality. It definitely lives up to... Volvo-ish standards, even though it is a Polestar, of course. Um, but you could kind of tell if when I close the doors and things, it it's just a put together car. Uh, Android Automotive is, aside from my app switching complaint and no background apps complaint, is really good. The uh, Google trigger word, uh, I'm not gonna say it so I don't trigger a bunch of house systems here. It works really well. You can say play Spotify, uh, open maps or navigate to, and then an address or a place or whatever. It's using Google maps. So it works really well. I haven't really tried a whole lot of other voice commands, but the core ones work perfectly. Uh, and the navigation is really good because it is Google maps, which is kind of the standard for mapping systems. Uh, I think they could improve the instrument clusters system a bit. Uh, I think there's some opportunity there to add some more features and just make it a bit better. But overall, a really good package and Polestar's actually been rolling out updates 
fairly frequently. I mean, it's definitely not like Tesla level of updates, but I think they've done like 10, 15 updates since these cars first came out, maybe even more than that. So pretty good frequency of updates and significant improvements since these cars originally came out. Charging is way better. It has preconditioning now. Uh, those are the two major ones and just overall really good improvements to the car since it came out. So that's enabled by the Android Automotive, not to be confused with Android Auto, which is the system that allows you to like mirror your Android phone. This is Android Automotive, which is its own operating system for cars. And it actually does have CarPlay for iOS devices, corded only, but it doesn't have Android Auto. So a little weird, but I guess they figure if you have an Android Automotive car, you don't need Android Auto on, from your phone on your car. I don't know. Maybe that bothers some people, but I have an iPhone and I don't even use CarPlay on this car because the built-in stuff just works so well. Another awesome feature of this car, number six here, the charging speed display. It will show you volts and amps and kilowatt while DC fast charging, which is awesome. Some cars don't even show you the kilowatt, like Ford products or uh, the Volkswagen ID4, at least for model year 2021. But this car not only shows you kilowatts, but it actually shows you the volts and the amps that you're charging at, which is just fantastic. It, I couldn't ask for better. Uh, and then when you're AC charging, so plugged into like a, just a level two charger or EVSE technically, not a charger, um, it'll show you the phases. In the US, it's only going to be single phase because that's all J1772 can support. Uh, but it also shows you volts and amps, but it actually doesn't show you kilowatts, which is a little weird, but you can easily calculate that. That's not a, that doesn't really matter. It's fine. But every EV should give you this level of detail with the charging information. It, there's no reason not to. It's The car knows it. Just tell the user or put it under a menu that's like expert mode or more information or something. Just make it available, please. Every automaker, please. Uh, like I mentioned during the walk around, my number five here is that it looks fantastic. And I truly think this is a stunning car. People ask me all the time, what is it? Uh, and then I have to explain what Polestar is and all that because I'll answer, oh, it's a Polestar too. And they're like, who makes it? I'm like, Polestar. They're like, well, who owns Polestar? Mm, Polestar, but their sister company to Volvo. And there's that whole conversation, but the car looks great. It's pretty stealthy, I would say, but still a very clean looking car, similar to most modern Volvos. Uh, I really like that this car is a hatchback instead of a normal sedan. Uh, I'm not really a sedan person. I don't like limiting the space that you can put stuff into uh, just by the size of the opening. So that's part of the reason I went with this over a Model 3. So hatchback, love it. Please make more. The buying experience for this car. Uh, I made... I might make a separate video about this topic actually, but overall the buying experience for this car was awesome. Uh, I went into the Polestar space uh, just to check out the cars. Turns out they had a couple in stock. I bought one, no, M or no markup, no negotiations. They just made it happen because they had cars in stock and there's, because it's direct to consumer-ish, I would say, uh, there are no markups. So it's similar to the Tesla buying experience in that regard, but you still have local staff because it was actually through my local Volvo dealer that Polestars are sold, but it's kind of a separate entity. I don't fully understand how it works, but it leads to a good customer experience. That's what matters. This car is fast. That's my number two here. Uh, it's I believe 408 horsepower, somewhere around there, uh, 300 kilowatt electric motor total. And this thing is not slow. People do not realize how much of a sleeper the Polestar 2 and especially the Volvo XC40 Recharge are. These things move. They're, I think, roughly 4.2 seconds, 0 to 60, which is not slow. And especially as you get to higher speed, it doesn't really slow down because it has pretty high horsepower. And tying into the speed, not only is it fast in a straight line, but it actually drives really well. The driving dynamics of this car are awesome. It handles really well, and especially if you get the performance pack, you can get actually get Olean suspension, which I don't think there are any other cars you can get Olean's on from the factory. 
um, maybe some like exotics, but definitely nothing under $100,000, I would say. And if you're not familiar with aftermarket suspensions, Oleans are pretty much top dog as far as overall balance between performance, comfort, price. There are higher end suspensions, but they're just awesome. And this not having the performance package doesn't have those, but even the standard suspension, it's it's comfortable, but still sporty. And this thing is just awesome to throw into a corner. And just like that, we've wrapped up my review, top 10 likes, dislikes of my Polestar 2 after driving it for just about 4,000 miles, about 3,800 miles in just over a month. If you have any questions, certainly comment down below. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, hit the like button. And if you want to see future content, because this car isn't going to be around too much longer, but I think you'll like the next car, please hit the subscribe button. And if you really like it, hit the notification bell as well. Really helps out the channel. And we'll see you guys next time.